Mac? It sounded like when you click off a window or something and you're not supposed to, like an arrow click or something. But it, it, yeah, it's the notification sound, so it would it would make that same one. But it did do it all Sunday. But he, he, he I was gonna say he must have muted it, so we don't know what it's what it's telling us then, like what the sound is for. That's okay. Beats me. I don't have anything to do with that. I don't know. Yeah, seriously, leave me alone. Hello, hello. <clears throat> Thank you. Okie dokie. Well, good evening. If you would uh, join me, let's, uh, let's go into James chapter 2 together. It is good to see you. Glad to see uh, I did see Danny, right? Okay. So, it's his birthday. Oh, Friday. Okay. Okay, so we'll... <laughs> um, wiffle ball... Got off to a crashing start last night, I heard. And I hated to miss the first, the first night of our wiffle ball games. Um, would have been, or it was. I, I mean, the pictures look fantastic that Kathy caught. But <laughs> at, at least 50 years younger. I'm glad you guys are playing, though. And, and nobody got, like, seriously hurt. I think there was some, some Tony did Okay. <laughs> or even scarring. He's got a slice across his hand. And, um, so. <laughs> so, anyway, the first game, and then this coming week, we'll be picking up a team. And uh, so it's, it, it'll be, if you're bored on a Tuesday evening, um, 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock are the start times. It's a four versus four, just wiffle ball games. It's. What did I say? Six o'clock and seven o'clock, right? Six and seven are the two games. So four versus four. And uh, I heard, now Johnny was here just a little bit ago, and I heard you guys did pretty well, though. He was, he had nothing but good things to say. So. Was he? Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of you to take it easy on the young guys. Next week? Well, good. So that got off to a start last night, so I'm glad that some of the guys are back this evening and still moving. And, uh, and, and to, to everyone's credit, running on the gym floor in there is not easy. Um, the, the, the pain of, of being on a concrete floor running is, is challenging. It hurts your shins, hurts your feet, hurts everything, so... Um, even the young guys, they, don't, they won't say it out loud, but they were sore this, this afternoon. Well, we just didn't really have to run a lot. You didn't have to run a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your motion is this, I think, right? Okay, I got you. <laughs> no. Very good. Well, we're going to be in James chapter 2 this evening before we spend some time praying. But uh, before we even look into God's Word, let's begin our time together. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we will continue this series on faith that works, looking through the book of James. Father, we thank you for this evening. God, I thank you that you have blessed this church with the facilities that we have. And uh, Lord, I don't know all of the stories that go into how they became what they are, but God, we are so thankful for um, the space that we have and the ability that we have to, to have things like the, the basketball and the volleyball and wiffle ball and all these different activities. And, and Lord, they are good just to get together and laugh and uh, hopefully be free from injury. 
But Lord, I pray that as we go into these seasons in the open gym, that again, these might be tools in your hand to introduce people to Christ. And so God, thank you that we're able to do these things um, here in Norwood. And, and Lord, I, I am appreciative to you and to the previous leadership for that. And um, God, I do pray that you would meet with us this evening. Lord, would you give us clarity as we go through the book of James, as we continue to see the interaction of our faith into our daily lives. And um, Lord, may we see how our faith and our relationship to you through the gospel um, really does impact our entirety. Uh, everything that we are, everything that we do, all of that should run through the filter of your word. And so, Lord, help us to see this evening how um, our faith works on display, that, that it should be a visible um, faith that we have. And so, Lord, I thank you again for what you're doing in this place. Um, please, Lord, would you give us some understanding of this text, and we'll give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in James chapter 2, about halfway through, a little bit more than halfway through. We're going to pick up in verse number 14. Last week, we talked about faith that works through, um, I can't remember the word that we use, but, but through love, through non-discriminatory love, and we looked at that passage comparing um, the entrance of a rich man and a poor man to the church, and I would venture to guess that that was kind of a corrective passage of such, um, as James is strongly encouraging the church in Jerusalem not to favor one person over another, but in fact to love equally as Christ died equally. And so as we get into verse number 14 then, um, you kind of have a topic shift. Um, it's going to change direction a little bit, and we're going to look through another way that our, our faith works, that it's active, it's, it's part of our everyday life, or so it should be. Um, so I want you to, if you will, in verse number 14, read along with me. We'll just read down to verse number 17, okay? Verse number 14, James chapter 2. And what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And so as you get into there, there, there probably has been and always will be this holy war between methods of salvation. It's, it's that ongoing de de debate of, are we really saved by faith and faith alone, or is there an element of works-based salvation that could be true? And I would tell you that James chapter 2, at least for, starting in verse 14 and following, are one of those texts that if we don't take a lot of time and really look into it, you might, on a superficial level, draw the conclusion that salvation is of works. I'm going to show you why that is in just a minute, and then we're going to debunk that, um, seeing that, again, it is, it is highly unwise to develop a system of theology or even a belief system on one verse. That, that's really a challenging thing to do, and it would be highly um, discouraged practice. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. That's what Paul says to do. Um, and so when you look at especially maybe verse number 14, it seems like um, there's a particular question, well, there is a particular question being asked. So James begins this discussion, and he asks this question. Ready? He says this in verse number 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? Now, I want you to think about that, and I'm going I'm to throw it over to you. The ball's going to be in your court. What is the answer to James's question in verse 14? Can faith save him? Yes or no? How many of you say, yeah, I'm on board with that statement? Faith can definitely save that guy. Where are you at? Put your hands up if that's true. It's okay. It's all right. It, nobody's going to think any less of you. Okay, now put your hands down. That was a good portion. Connect the first two statements to that question. Okay, so he says in verse 14, What does a prophet, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can that faith save him? How many of you would say, yeah, a person can have faith and no works and still be saved? I am on board with that. Okay, so now I've got a lot of confused faces, um, and that's a good thing. All right, so here's the idea. It's, it's the thought that when he says, can faith save him, he's referring to a specific type of faith that was just mentioned, the type being faith that doesn't have works. Is it sufficient to save? Now, the obvious answer is what? We know Ephesians chapter 2, we'll come to that in just a minute, 
that we are saved by grace through faith, nothing else, that our, our salvation is solely resting on our faith in the completed work of Christ. So with that back knowledge, you look at verse number 14 and you see the question, can faith say him? And the church-grown Sunday school kind of answer is 100% yes, of course. Faith and faith alone can save. But I want to tell you that the way that the rest of these verses are going, that the answer to the question is a resounding no. That type of faith that James just mentioned is not is not what we're thinking. So here's what happens from verse 14 all the way to the end of the chapter. James is going to outline three different types of faith. That's the question. Can that type of faith save somebody? And he's going to give an illustration to help us tie it all together, and I hope that it makes sense. So here's the question. What benefit is there to a man who says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? Or can that type of faith save him? Save him? So there are three types of faith that are going to surface in James chapter 2 in the latter part of the chapter. And here they are. I'm going to give them to you, then we'll show them to you in the scriptures just so we're on the same page moving forward. The first type of faith that you find is what we would call a professing faith. Um, it is the idea of just using the word say. I am saying that I have faith. Look at verse 14. For what doth, the, uh, pro- what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man, what? says he has faith, but doesn't have works. So that's a professing of faith. I have told you that I have faith, but my, my words and my actions don't line up. So what I am saying and what, I'm, what I am doing aren't necessarily on board. And so the question is this. If a person says he has faith, but there are no works, who benefits in the long run? The individual does, um, but does anybody else? Well, No, there's no benefit to other people from that faith. So there's a professing faith. In James chapter 2, that type of faith is referenced three different times. Verse 14 is the first of the three. Then there's a personal faith. It is this idea of, in James 2, it's the word believe that we're going to highlight as we go through it. So the personal faith is the one that is beneficial to the individual as well. I believe, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 reminds us that we are saved by grace through faith. And through that belief, I am saved. So I profess, I say with my mouth, and it becomes a personal relationship that I have. But then there's a third kind of faith, and this is the challenge. This is where James is working us to, and it's called a public faith. It's the idea of our behavior. So it moves from saying I have faith to believing I have faith to acting like I have faith. It's three totally different types. Now, if you are behaving as if you are a person of faith, not only do you benefit because the other two are already included, but who else benefits? If I'm living as if a Christian should live, who else benefits? Christians, other Christians do. Who else does? Okay, everybody around you, Christians and non-Christians alike, certainly you'll edify, you'll encourage each other, but the influence of your Christianity should be seen. So again, apparently in the church in Jerusalem, there might have been an issue with this idea of we can come to church and really talk really good, but the other six days of the week or however many um, days they would have outside of their service schedule, it wasn't lining up. What they were saying in worship wasn't jiving with what they were doing every other day of the week. So three types of faith. Here they are. You have your professing faith. James chapter 2 uses the word say. And then you have your personal faith. It uses the word believe, and you as yourself um, benefits from that. You profit from that. And then you have a public faith, which is your behavior, and other people profit. So here's a statement, and I think that we can understand this. Talk is, how would you finish that word, that sentence? Talk is, talk's cheap. It's easy to say a lot of things, to promise a lot of things, and never come through on them. And uh, and so James is now conveying the necessity of a faith that produces works by giving us verse 15 and verse 16, okay? So look at the text. Here's the illustration. So verse number 14, if if a person, what does the prophet, my brethren, if a man says, there's that professing faith, that he has uh, faith but no works, can faith save him? Well, here's the illustration. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you, what's the word? 
say, professes, okay, there's that type of faith. He says unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. Here's the same question. What's the point? What did they profit from coming to you with their need when you just have that superficial, not you, but in the illustration, when that individual that's approached simply says or professes that they have faith enough to give you what you need, but yet they do nothing about it. So watch our three types of faith. You have the professing faith. It's right there in verse number 15, uh, or verse number 16, and one of you says, all right, now here's the thing. What are things that we can say in church that literally doesn't benefit anybody, but we catch ourselves saying it all the time? Can you think of one? Okay, let's, yeah. The churches around town, other than Ashland, <laughs> what are things that Christians in general say, um, but, you know, it doesn't hold a lot of water. It uh, doesn't line up with their actions. I've got three that I'll give you if this hits a stalemate, but I think you know where I'm going. This is not indicative of you as an individual, just things you have heard people say that doesn't line up with their behavior. <clears throat> what do you think? Okay, so some form of priority, some form of preeminence. God's number one in my life, and then, you know, the other six days of the week don't really prove that theory a whole lot. What else? It's a good one. Things people say in church that they don't really act on very well. Hey, all right. Come on. Okay, thank you. I'll pray for you. Now, listen. With the best intentions, those words are spoken, okay? I will pray for you. In just a moment, we'll have these prayer lists. We'll take those home. We'll be praying for each other. Every one of us in this room have said those words and then did not act on it. Every one of us. There, there's nothing to be ashamed about. It's, it's part of the discipline of Christianity to commit to pray for somebody. And then you get caught up in, the, in just the craziness of life. And that promised prayer request is not satisfied. What else? Give me another one. If you need anything, just let me know. And, and <laughs> have you, not surely, okay, we're not pointing fingers or throwing daggers, but have you ever said that thinking, oh, I hope they don't call. <laughs> I just, I really, okay, so some people are very honest this evening, but sometimes you're thinking, I, I, I'm going to throw this out there, but even if you call, I'm not sure what I would do. Um, that might be a little more appropriate. I, I, I am willing to. The flesh is willing, but this, you know, I just don't know what to do if that happens or if they actually do follow me up. Um, great example. Give me one more. Things that we say, but we don't always work out well. Okay, so that detailed answer hits the <laughs> nail on the head. I am verbally supportive of the church, and yet presence is inconsistent. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of really kind words to say, but um, shoot it straight. You and Shirley both tonight, you're, you're on it. But you, you see what I'm saying. It's, it's sometimes easier to say things, but listen, if it's simply a verbalized faith, nobody benefits in that. Nobody, not even the person speaking those words benefit. So the question is, what does it profit if somebody comes from you to you naked and absolutely starving, and verse 15 is your or verse 16 is your response, and you say, go be hungry, go be filled, go, go have clothes. What is the point? So the illustration is this: that professing faith doesn't help either the professor or the professee. Nobody benefits in that. But then you come to that second statement, and it's that idea, or that second type of faith. So it's not just professing faith, but here's the one. It's personal faith. Um, have you ever, let's see, have you ever heard somebody say something like, I've seen God do this for me. I've been through this before, and they communicate to this. this probably somebody struggling. They say, God's going to do the same for you. Have you ever heard that? Something along those lines. God's got me through things just like you're going through. And again, the best intentions speak those words. God's brought me through this before and he's going to bring you through. But is that a promise that we have the authority to make? Can, can we make that statement? Well, God's brought me through and he met all my needs and he's going to do the same for you. Now, God's going to meet needs. He's going to stay faithful, as we talked about on Sunday morning, to his promises. But it's not always going to work out, A, how we wanted it to, and B, exactly how we did for your case. 
And so the personal faith, who benefited in that statement? I get to tell you about what God did. So the benefit is to the person speaking those words. But again, if I say, you know, Bill, I, I, know, you're, I know you're hungry and you know, your, your clothes are, you don't have a whole lot, so God gave me clothes once. And then I walk away. I benefited from the feeling of, well, I did something. I got to speak into Bill's life. I got to change. Did he benefit at all? So your professing faith doesn't benefit anybody, really. Your personal faith gets to benefit the speaker. But here's back to chapter 2, verse 14. It's the idea of, can this type of faith save anybody? That's the question. So you keep reading, and you look into um, the two types of faith that we've talked about so far. And the personal faith and the professing faith, professing faith, needy people are headed back into the cold without clothes and without food. To say that God has done this for me in the past does not meet the immediate need of the, of the hurting. And to just tell them or just to say things like, I hope you find something, I hope this works out for you, that doesn't benefit anybody at all. And so can I, can I make this statement? That Christianity will die if all we do is talk and never do. Christianity will die. I mean, honestly, where we are right now, again, you've heard me allude to these things because it's, it is contemplated and, and surveyed out the wazoo right now. But you can almost call in hospice care on the, on the American church right now. As the numbers continue to circle the drain, why do you think that is? And I'm just going to throw this out here. Could it be that we have gotten really good about talking and sounding the part? But man, when it comes to doing things, when it comes to the faithfulness that we talked about Sunday morning, just a, just a theory, could it be that the other six days of our weeks are not matching up with the words that come out of our mouth on a Sunday morning at 1030? Could that be? I mean, it's just, it's just a theory, and we'll have to prove that later. So here's the rest of the text. Look at verse 16 again. And one of you say unto them, this is the person who is naked, has no clothes and no food, depart in peace, be warmed not, and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Now the answer to the end of verse number 16 is what? What does it profit to say those words and do nothing? Is there any benefit? Is there any profit at all? No. That person in need does not profit anything. So those of us that come on Thursday afternoon for Ashland Loves, this is probably not going to be built into the game plan. People come in and we say, oh, you know, we're sorry that this is the predicament that you're in. Go be hungry, go be filled, go have clothes, and then we send them out the door. It doesn't make any sense, and they're not going to come back. It's not going to have any impact on their lives at all, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is what? Is dead. You're familiar with this passage. You, you know this. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So here is the deal. Here is the challenge. Our faith cannot reside just in the typology of personal and, and professing. There has to be a day where that third element uh, or that third type of faith begins to work its way out in our lives. What I say and what I believe has to affect how I behave. And so our public faith is that acting on the ability to meet someone's needs, and that's what faith is all about. So the only benefit to the hungry is what? If you want to benefit the hungry, what do you do? Give them food. Give them a sandwich. Here's a hot dog or whatever it is. What is it tomorrow, Tony? What's on the menu? Hot dogs. Give them hot dogs or chips. I think we had some food donated from Laura, by the way. So give them chips and give them cookies. That's the need. If they come in here this winter and they're cold and freezing, what do we give them? We give them clothes, we give them blankets, we help make sure they have the necessities of life, and in doing so, demonstrate our faith in a Christ who met our needs both, both physically and spiritually as well. But I think the second part of chapter 2, verse 18, sums it up well for us. James says this, show me your faith without your works, because obviously that's, there, that's where they are. You keep doing what you're doing, but what does James say? And I will show you my faith by my works. So don't ever just look at verse 14 and start to wonder, well, I wonder if the Bible is really teaching that it is a works-based salvation. That's not what James is communicating whatsoever. 
what he is working towards is verse number 18, where you have those two theologies that are, that are coming to a head. You have group A, who are totally satisfied with believing and talking about theology and talking about salvation, yet lacking works. And James says, I'm all for the talking stuff, but I'm also going to live out exactly what it is I'm talking about. There is going to be an alignment of my behavior that is going to line up specifically with my beliefs and with what I say. And so if somebody comes to me that is hungry, then I will give them food. If somebody comes to me and they are cold, I will find them clothes because that's what our faith is all about. Debate theology, do what you want, but displaying our faith too little impacts no one. So he says, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. Why? Because he makes that very important statement in verse number 18. Because faith without works is, what was that word again? It is dead. Okay, two different definitions of the word dead. Ephesians chapter 2, we define dead as what? Do you remember that? That's going way back now on Sunday mornings. What is the theological or biblical definition of death? Summed up in one word. What? Dead? Separation. Separation. The, two, the two are synonymous. De- death, spiritually, And eternally is the separation from the soul and spirit from the presence of God. That's spiritual death. Physically, what? It's the separation of the the flesh and bone from the spirit and the soul physically. And so here's what happens in James chapter 2. The idea here is in a physical sense, something that is dead had to be at one time what? I mean, this is like we're really really getting complicated now. Something that was once dead had to be dead alive at some point, okay, for it to pass away. But death means separation. So there's been a separation, James says, from your works and your faith. That's why he says at the end of verse number 18, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 17, being alone. There's a separation that has taken place. Now, in the physical sense, something that is dead was once alive, and something that's alive shows signs of it. Um, maybe half hour before church, if you were in Norwood, just maybe at 6 o'clock-ish, right at the top of the hour, there was all kinds of sirens that went down Montgomery Road. I don't know if you heard it or not, but this is part of who I am, and I can't handle not knowing. I don't know if it's just me, but there's something in me that says you get in your car and you go and follow them. I didn't, but I did the next best thing, and I sent a message to Wes and said, what is going on? I knew it was working. And um, there was a call that came in, and it illustrated this perfect. I thought it exactly of tonight when he said this. There was a call that came in of an overdose right down the street towards Xavier. And, and of course, when the police respond, the fire department responds, the ambulance, everybody and their brother responds to this kind of event. And they got on the scene, and the person wasn't behaving as if they were alive. They were still, they were on the ground, not moving. The assumption is what? They are, or they're needing some immediate attention, and that's going to be the result if they don't get it. Well... All of that commotion was because this lady decided to take a nap. She was asleep. Okay. She was alive. Somebody saw her, assumed for some reason that it was an overdose. She was doing just fine, just taking a nice Wednesday afternoon nap. But the problem is what? Somebody that is alive should act like they are. They show signs of it. You watch their chest go up and down. You watch them twitch in their sleep. You, you know that they're alive, and only when they are dead do they not act like it. So the question that James throws out here is, does your faith show signs of life? Or does somebody look at you in the spiritual sense and assume there is no spiritual life in you whatsoever because you are not bearing out, you are not working out your faith, as Hebrews teaches us? So look at verse number 19. James says, you believe that there is one God, He says, you do well. The devils also believe and they tremble. But will you know, will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Reiterating that statement. So as much as you believe that there's one God, you have to believe that faith without works is dead. So let me ask you this evening. Do you believe that there is one God? Yes or no? We believe in a single God comprised of three individual persons. There is one God. So we would answer that question, yes, 100%, I believe that there is one God. Then James says, as much as you believe that there is one God, you must equally believe that faith without works is dead. Because that singular God taught that singular truth. The only difference is whether or not we live it out. One more illustration you get to, and it's found in verse number 21. So let's go back into the Old Testament. Now again, 
pointing back to biblical, historical, especially fathers of the faith like Abraham, who was the recipient of the covenant of God, um, is one of those telltale signs that he's really driving home a strong point. If you elicit Abraham to prove a point, you are trying to get right to the foundation, especially of the Jewish tradition, being in Jerusalem. So verse 21, was not Abraham, and that would have been a games changer. That would have, been, that would have stopped them in their tracks as soon as they heard that word Abraham. Now you're, hey, I just, that's okay. Can I, can I make mention of you real quick? Yeah. I just used you as an illustration, but I didn't ask your permission. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Okay, good. good. We'll move on. James chapter 2, verse 21. So Abraham, boom, stopped in the tracks. As soon as that name is, is spoken, everybody's ears are going to perk up because every Jewish person knows Abraham. He's, he's the father of all of this. And so Abraham, verse 21, our father was justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Okay. Now, was it not just established in the preceding verses that we are saved by faith, not by works, but we demonstrate our faith by our works? Then you get to verse 21. Now we're talking about Abraham. So James chapter 2, verse 21 is a, is a tricky question. Was Abraham justified? Was he declared righteous by his works when he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. So I'm going to spin this around on you real quick, and let's, let's hear the thoughts, and then I'll, um, I'll give you my meanderings. Answer the question in verse number 21. Was Abraham declared righteous the moment that he offered Isaac as a sacrifice? What is the answer to verse number 21? Okay, so there is a difference between justified, being made righteous in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. Okay, there is a, a major difference there. We'll, we'll distinguish that because that's a great point. Other thoughts? What do you think? Where did that, did that sum it up? Because that was a really nail on the head strike. Yes, ma'am. Stephanie. Well, you can't. No, no, no. See, here's the way this works. Questions can't, can't be answered with questions. One rule in public discourse. Um, because that, that's, that's not. Who, I saw a hand. I'll go over here to Xavier real quick. You're, you're skipping ahead. You saw my notes. You cheated. No, no you're, you're thinking the right direction. Go ahead, Xavier, and then we'll, we'll, we'll put a bow on it. Verse 23. Read, read it, there, Xavier. I turn to Genesis 15. Yeah, it switched to English. Chad will understand. Okay, so the answer is what? The answer is yes. Okay, now here's the question because there are two aspects to justification. Justification is that theological fancy term that just means to be declared righteous. And so justification, the two aspects are this. Number one, being declared righteous by and before God. When does that take place? When are you declared righteous before a holy God as a sinful man? Right at the instance of your faith being transferred to Christ, you are automatically declared righteous. You are justified in the eyes of God. Um, Romans teaches us that the righteousness of Christ is placed on or imputed to your account. So before God, right when you're saved, you are declared righteous. However... From that day until the day God calls you home or he comes back, whichever one happens first, there's an ongoing proof of righteousness that is lived out. So look at Genesis chapter, I'll just read it for you. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. It's hard to answer the question of James chapter 2 without looking back at the instance where it occurred. Genesis chapter 15, verse number 6 says about Abraham, and he believed in the Lord. Okay, step number one, he believed in the Lord. So when did his righteousness get applied to his account? 
right then, right when he believed in the Lord, he believed the promise of God, and then the rest of the verse says, and it counted to him for righteousness. So in, in Genesis 15, verse 6, there is no connection with the offering of Isaac as a sacrifice as to his being made righteous in the eyes of God. Do you see that? His righteousness had already been declared in the eyes of God because Abraham trusted the promises of God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He didn't have a Jesus to look at yet. He's looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. He doesn't have the privilege of looking back on him. So he was saved by his faith. And as a result, what happens? Because of his faith, did Abraham's works follow? Okay, now think all the way into Genesis chapter 22. Gets up Isaac, gets him on, on, the, on the animals, brings a servant with him. Don't miss that part, that there is a servant that came with him. When they got to the foot of the hill of Mount Moriah, what did Abraham say to his servant? Oh, this is crazy. Do this real quick. Go to Genesis 22. You have to see this, and, and then you'll have, a, a, I think, a, a good understanding of the way this works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, he did. So look at Genesis 22, and let's, let's show you what, what Randy just mentioned. This is so important. And this is one of those things that if you just kind of glaze over it, you're going to miss it. But you've got to see this. Genesis 22, God has told in verse number 2, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. You know what the crazy thing was? The initial instruction from God to Abraham wasn't even specific enough to tell him where to go. He didn't know where he was going. Mount Moriah was not an individual mountain. Mount Moriah was a mountain range. And so think, think chronologically. Genesis 15, Abraham believed God, and it was counted in him for righteousness. He's already declared righteous. Seven chapters later is the instance where his faith is played out. Verse number two, God says, take your son, take him to Moriah, and what's going to happen? Once you take that first step, then what? Then I'm going to show you where to go. Did you catch that in verse number? This is probably one of my favorite Old Testament passages beside 1 Kings 18 and the showdown with, with the, the prophet of Baal, with Elijah. So verse number two, get thee into the land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon, I mean, make note of this, one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Remember James chapter 1 where there's testings and there's trials that, there, that the testings that God introduces is to strengthen a faith? This is where Abraham's at. I am going to strengthen. All you got to do is start walking and I'll show you which direction to go. So keep reading. Verse number 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place of far. No, no, I'm sorry. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he clave the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose up and when he went unto the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar of off. Then he knew. So his steps were ordered by God but it was revealed after he began the process of obedience. Verse number five, And Abraham said unto his young man, this is what Randy was alluding to, and this is so important. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and who else? And the lad, me and Isaac, we're, we're going to go up yonder and worship, and we both, we both will come again to you. I don't know if you've ever caught that statement or not, but there was a confidence in the voice of Abraham that was saying, I know we're going up there. I know what God's called me to do, but I also know that God's going to provide. And I also know that I have to trust his promises. And I also know that I have to live out my faith in God. I cannot leave Isaac down here. I must bring him up there. And you know how it all played out. It got to the bottom of the ninth with two outs before God provided the ram that was caught up in the bushes. But God provided because Abraham believed and he followed him in, in obedience. See how that works? Isn't that an amazing statement? So now you go back to James chapter 2. And that was the order. Genesis 15, Abraham already believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness sake in the eyes of God. But the proof was lived out for who? Who benefited in Genesis 22? Obviously, Abraham and Isaac did, but who else benefited? Well, we did, being able to look back on the account, but don't forget about the two fellows who were left at the bottom of the mountain. I mean, they are assuming that Abraham is taking Isaac up there with the intentions and only one person coming back down that mountain. But can you imagine the feeling in the heart of those servants as they watch both of them come back down? Abraham was living out his faith 
And when they came down and they became within an eyesight of those servants, his proof was made. Those servants, I wish the text would give us the inside scoop on what went through their mind. But suffice it to say, I believe the faith of those servants was strengthened that day because Abraham lived it out. You can have your faith and no works, but I'm going to have my faith and I'm going to prove it by my works. So now you're back in James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? The answer there is, yes, he was. He was made righteous in the eyes of at least those two servants, not to mention the whole crowd of people that would have gathered together when Abraham and Isaac got home. In the eyes of the people, he was made righteous. Their faith was strengthened. Not in the eyes of God. That already took place in chapter 15, verse 6. Chapter 22 was his proof of righteousness. So verse 22, where where, uh, Xavier was, seest thou how faith wrought his works. First, first, First works, good grief. I got caught up on that word. First faith, then works. That is the biblical pattern of Christianity. I am going to have my faith, but I'm going to show you my faith. I'm going to demonstrate my faith by my works. And because of Abraham's works, he was made complete. He was made whole. And so as you kind of draw to the end of chapter 23 or chapter 2 here, um, you also have one more example in verse 25. This one's a lot less brief, and we're not going to hop back to it. But likewise, he says, well, let's read verse 24. You did see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The caveat to verse 24 is there is no confusion when you understand that this is justification between man and man, not between man and God. So verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way? And so if you remember, Rahab had a rough life, but given the chance to act on her faith, she jumped in with both feet, and she was justified before man by her housing of the spies and producing a way of escape. So you get to the conclusion of the topic is this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And Christian, we, we have to grab this concept that our, our, our faith is not just something to be spoken about, although it is, and it's not just something to be spoken about on a Sunday, but it's something to be lived out. We demonstrate, we prove, we work out our faith, not trying to earn God's favor, but trying to demonstrate our faith through our works. Thoughts? Well, very good then. Let's, let's, um, let's take a few minutes and go over our prayer list, if you will. We've got the updated uh, things that were mentioned um, last week. And um, if there is, again, something that we can update or remove, or if you have a praise, those are good too. Um, we'd like to add those. Those are on the back side of the page, I believe. As you are thinking about this, I did want to mention a couple things that I've become aware of this week. Um, And that is, first of all, I'm not sure that anybody remembers or knows Rita Ellis. If you've been in the church for a while, maybe you do. Um, Rita passed away, we we learned, two weeks ago. And uh, we are going to be having a funeral here for her at some point. We'll uh, we'll definitely announce that. But Rita has, uh, over the years, uh, been a part of Ashland and um, fell into some some physical needs and and subsequently passed away. And so if you know her, then I wanted you to be uh, aware of that. And then also... Um, Alma Owens, who it's been quite some time since, since she's been in service, but um, lives a couple streets down on Madison, fell uh, over the weekend and broke um, both sides of her jaw and is downtown uh, in the hospital. And um, her family all lives out of state. And so they've got some pretty major decisions on her health care, living situation, those kinds of things um, as she heals from hopefully the surgery that she'll have soon. So I'll be praying for Alma Owens of no relationship to Pat. Um, okay, so a surgery, maybe, maybe it's not required. Okay, okay. So keep, keep praying for her, though. It's, it's a, 
uh, severe injury that she sustained for sure. Um, what else? As you look over the list, is there anything that we can add? Michaela Patton, she's posted this on social media, but um, they are still adapting and adjusting to having an, a new little one at home. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Just right now. Okay, well, real-time updates. So Bonnie and, the, and uh, Michaela are headed to um, get a little more details and, and seeing what's going on with the new baby there. What? Corinne is ready to go. Yes, we'll be praying for Corinne and, uh, and Jerry Thompson as well, as you think about it, um, both of which are, yes, ma'am. Next week? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, if you, yeah, if you didn't hear that or if you're online, um, Danny Wright is three-quarters of the way down under the health category. He will be receiving another cancer treatment next week, but also his mother fell. And you said she did have a second hip replacement, um, but now has developed COVID on top of it. And so be praying that um, some of the side effects that could result of not being able to move around do not take place. Um, it's not on the list, but if you think about um, or add to uh, Mike Faust, his mom fell Sunday morning. Um, after she just had a hip replacement. And so I think she's going to be okay, but um, definitely could use some prayers there as well. We had mentioned last week Don Lowe. He's doing, um, he's doing well. He, his response was funny. He, he listed the number of screws and inches of metal that they put in. So he said, I think given what I've been through, I'm doing well. But he has a long road ahead of him. Um, so if you continue to pray for Don and Don Lowe, and then Don Ayers is here and and Don Ears is doing okay. He's trying to heal. Yep. But uh, they were able to get all of the cancer. Yep. And uh, so we'll just pray for a quick healing of the removal of that. So. And, uh, he's been a lot. He's okay. Been okay. Okay. Where did he end up here? Bill is on the back. He had a correctional surgery, I think Friday, um, for a catheter insertion. So Don said all of that went well and we can remove him. Anything else? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you know her? Okay. Did you know that was me that sent the group message? Okay. That was that was a really good service. Um, very good service. She would have been 104 next month, um, but was able to be a part of that Sunday, uh, not Sunday Monday. Murdy Parker. Shirley, sorry. Thank you. We'll leave first thing tomorrow morning, and we'll be back at the beginning of next week. But if you think about it, we would. Uh, it's not been a good day today. I'll tell you that. Um, her car is loaded, and all of that is. It got a little real when you're carrying totes out to the car. And up to this point, it's been okay. But if you think about it, she'll start classes on Monday, and she'll get orientated and all the rest um, in the days leading up to that. So if you think about it, we would appreciate it. But it's what we raised her for, and. She'll be fine. <laughs> of what? Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> yeah. All you had to do is look at me Sunday morning during the music, and I thought, geez, lost it, lost it during the singing Sunday morning. Morgan was on the platform, and they were singing about the blessings being passed on from generation to generation. And um, I asked Jody after Sunday morning, don't, don't put that one on there for a while. <laughs> let's, let's leave that. That was not kind. And you put it right before the message. So... Um, if you think about it, we'd appreciate it. Anything else? I got a, I got a house. 
Jay's got his living situation squared away. So we'll, we'll add that under the praise category. So Jay's got a house. Yes, ma'am, Stephanie. Stephanie got a house. Everybody's getting a house. You get a house. And you get, everybody's getting houses. The Randolphs have a house. Pray that that transition goes well. Anyone, anyone else get a house? Since we're, Chris and Corinne got a house. Um, I think they moved in last week, I believe. And so everybody's getting houses. It's a good thing in this market just to be able to get one. All right, very good then. I'll tell you what, we have, we have a few minutes here. Then um, let's, let's take a few minutes and pray for these. And again, I will, I'll begin. And if you would like to pray, um, you are more than welcome to. And if you're online with us, um, I'd encourage you before you close whatever app or browser you're using to, um, to pray with these as well. And I know Jace has been putting them up on the screen as we've been discussing them. But even if you're home, um, God can still hear you there. And so we're thankful for that. And so let's, let's have a good time of prayer together. And again, if we have a pause where nobody um, fills in, then we will uh, close in prayer as well, okay? Father, we are so grateful and thankful for the fact that our salvation um, is not merited or somehow earned by us and our goodness, but God, we can rest assured that our, that our faith is sufficient for salvation, that our faith in Christ and uh, His completed work of the gospel um, is enough to save us. And that, Lord, because of what you've done, um, and because of our faith in you, before you, our, our um, righteousness, the, the righteousness of Christ has been applied, and we thank you for that. But God, in the days that we have remaining after that, that new life that's been given to us through Christ, then we live out our faith, we demonstrate our faith, our faith works through display. And uh, God, the argument James presents is so challenging to us in this day that, sure, we might, we might have personal faith, and that benefits us, and we might have professing faith that nobody really benefits from, but God, I pray that we would have not just that personal faith, but a, an active faith, um, one that is public, one that is visible, one that has no shame, one that's not fearful of the response of others as we discuss biblical topics with, with those. And God, I just pray that you would give us a boldness to be faithful in the way that we live our lives. And Lord, may that demonstrate and open doors for conversation down the road to, to share Christ with others. And so, God, I do pray that we uh, would become more bold and more active um, in our faithfulness as we discuss Sunday morning, but also so that we would demonstrate and live out our faith. And so, God, we definitely thank you for, again, what you're doing in our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you and really have a lot to be praising you for and thanking you for before we even get to uh, the list of requests that we've mentioned. And, Father, we thank you for Jace and uh, for the Randolphs and providing them um, good living situations and, uh, Lord, for meeting that needs, especially when you really... Uh, it's oftentimes a race to be able to get a house the way things are hopping off the market. So, God, we are thankful for that and pray that the transition would go smooth and that, um, that you would be able to uh, allow them to get into those homes in a timely fashion and with ease. And, that God, that they would begin to make that their house and make that their home as well. And so, God, we thank you for it. And, Lord, we thank you for um, Don's surgery this past week and the success of it. God, we do ask that you would um, heal uh, where that surgery was performed. And, that God, we pray that you would... Um, continue to uh, fast track that healing as well. And what we do think of is his friend Bill. We thank you for the success of his surgery. We praise you for that. God, I pray for healing there as well. Uh, God, as we mentioned, even on Monday, celebrating the life of Murdy, God, I just pray it was a great crowd, an amazing crowd um, at, the, at the celebration of life. And Lord, I do ask that you would take the presentation of the gospel and, and that that would have uh, pricked the heart of one of the hearers and that they would have responded that uh, that day. And Lord, we thank you for Murdy's faithfulness and um, the way that she lived out her faith, even if it was just putting together quilts for people in the church. God, we thank you um, for uh, the, the faithfulness that she demonstrated and made that impact the group um, that was there on Monday. And uh, God, we think of right now the patents as they are um, taking Bonnie to the, the emergency room. And Lord, I pray that you would provide them answers. God, that the Doctors would be quick and efficient in the way that they are able to get her in and be able to um, get the information that they need to make a, a good, um, effective diagnosis. Uh, Lord, for um, Brett and Michaela, God, I pray that you would um, calm their fears, Lord, uh, that you would soften their anxieties, that you would give them a peace uh, and a trust in you to work things out according to your will. And, and God, we certainly uh, entrust them to you during this time. And uh, Lord, we do think of Jerry and of Corinne this evening, and God, I pray that you would 
um, continue to give strength. And uh, Lord, I know that both of those ladies are anxious to get this over with, but God, in the meantime, are, are uncomfortable and uh, at the same rate excited about um, uh, the coming of their new little one. And so I pray that you would um, continue to strengthen them, give them rest where they can, and uh, Lord, that you would um, be with them as they go through the delivery process. And uh, God, we think of, um, Lord, there's, there's all kinds of things that, that I'm sure that we continue to, to pray for. Lord, we definitely think about um, the, the kids that are heading off to college uh, for all those at Cedarville and, and everywhere else. Lord, this is a, a new time for many and a returning time for others, but it's an important four years. And I pray that you give them wisdom as they make their decisions and give them clarity as they declare majors and, and pursue this next phase of life and that we as a church may come alongside of them and love on them and um, let them know that they're prayed for even during the semester. And uh, God, I, I do pray that you would use them in a great way and uh, use the, the staff that they will be sitting under, um, especially on these Christian campuses like Cedarville and so forth, that the staff would be able to pour into their lives and, and develop them educationally, but also spiritually as well. And so Lord, we thank you um, for that. And uh, Father, we pray for Sue Bivin this evening. God, I know that she is still in discomfort because of her knee, but Lord, I pray that the replacement would be able to be scheduled quickly, that the, uh, the knee replacement would go well, and that we can see her back here regularly and moving around um, without pain, and uh, we'll, we'll give you the thanks for it. And so, Lord, we thank you for a chance just to be able to pray, just to be able to pause in the busyness of our week, to focus on others and, and, and on the needs of our own. And that, Lord, we, um, we cling to your promises, and we're thankful for the fact that we do have um, power in our prayers, that the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails that much. And so, God, we thank you for your concern, even if it's something we believe to be minuscule and uh, maybe even not even worthy of your time, that, God, you're interested in the smallest of details. And so, God, we thank you for a chance to be able to pray over the great needs and over things that we may deem small, but, Lord, nonetheless, they are of concern to you. So we thank you for your love for us in that way. Lord, we certainly pray for Danny's mother this evening, and God, I pray that you would um, protect her. Lord, this is a very vulnerable time for her, and God, I pray that you would um, allow her to get over this COVID very quickly, and Lord, that her stationary condition would not um, com uh, complicate things, but God, that you would give wisdom again and, and discernment to the staff that are caring for her and resp responsible for her well-being. So Lord, please, uh, would you care for her, and Lord, I know Jerry Kay, I mentioned Sunday over the live stream that he is um, still under the weather, and, and God, I pray that you would heal him, and Lord, we would certainly uh, love to see him back here as soon as possible, and uh, God, we think of uh, the family of Rita Ellis and, and her home going. Uh, God, we thank you for um, her faithfulness here over the years, and even when she couldn't be here, that God, she was still in full support of this church and praying for it, and, and um, Lord, we just thank you for her, and, and Lord, I pray that when this celebration of life is able to be scheduled um, here at Ashland, that God, we would be able to love on that family and that it might open up a door to share with them Christ, um, especially since Rita had a, had a personal relationship with you as well. And uh, God, there's a lot of other requests that are mentioned. And uh, Lord, we pray for Danny next week as he goes back for his next chemo treatment. And uh, Lord, I pray that that would be effective, that the side effects would be minimal. And uh, Lord, again, that you would strengthen him to be able to um, to go through this process of treatments that, that he is undergoing. And uh, Father, as we walk out of this place, may we do so, um, I know we said it kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit and, and, and poking fun at the things that we say, but all, also sometimes struggle to live it out. And, and Lord, I pray that our prayer time would not be that way. Lord, we're not probably going to remember everything, but may even pieces of paper like this be able to direct our attention to bring before you uh, the requests that our loved ones have. And so, God, please, would you help us to develop even deeper the discipline of prayer, and uh, Lord, that we can lean on the promises again that we've quoted and um, the others that we know exist. And so, Lord, please, would you dismiss us this evening with your protection. God, we'll look forward to being back together on Sunday morning, both in our small groups at 930 and in our time of worship at 1030. And uh, Lord, we'll look forward to hearing from you and your word in Philippians chapter, uh, chapter number two this week. And so, Lord, we love you. 
Thank you for this time together. Now help us now to remember the challenge uh, to demonstrate our faith by our works as we leave this place. And may we have an eternal impact because of it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, online viewer, thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I pray that our time together has encouraged or maybe even challenged your walk with the Lord. Maybe you've realized that you've never stopped and asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to take you to heaven someday. If that's the case, would you just pause this video and take a moment and pray? In your prayer, you can agree with God that you're a sinner that needs a Savior. You can confess your sins and you can place your faith in Christ as the only means means for forgiveness and the only means of securing your home in heaven. If you do stop and ask Christ to save you, would you send me an email directly to my inbox at pastor at ashlandavenue.org. I would love to celebrate this eternity impacting decision that you've made. If you're new to the ministries of Ashland and would like to learn more about who we are, head over to our website at ashlandavenue.org and you can spend some time there getting acquainted with us. If you'd like to financially support the ministries of Ashland, you can do that at the website as well. I also wanted you to know that besides being on YouTube, we're on Instagram at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church and Facebook where you can search Ashland ABC and we would love to connect with you there. As always, if you're in the area and looking for a church to call home or just looking for somewhere to worship, we would love to invite you to be our honored guest whenever you're available. We're so thankful to have had the opportunity to worship with you, and we do hope to see you again soon as we aim to love God, love people, and serve the world here at Ashland.